Got a brief delay here, but I'll, I'll welcome you back. I, I see all of our jurors are present. We're waiting for this uh, this uh, to come up. I'll give you a minute uh, for whatever you need, <clears throat> so that we can. Uh, so Mr. Durst can have a simultaneous transcript. Mr. Durst is present with Mr. Chesnov and Mr. DeGarren. <coughs> Mr. Lewin is at the lectern. Mr. Milley is at council table. We have Mr. Miata, Mr. Henderson, and Mr. Balian. And uh, I'm glad to see you all back. And uh, we all need to, to be uh, very careful with all of the cases of uh, the Delta variant. It's, uh, it is a, a dangerous situation. <coughs> there are uh, Exceptions I, I have uh, made that I'm required to make uh, when uh, for persons who might have difficulty wearing masks when when speaking, and so I, I have uh, allowed that. But uh, we do need to be as careful as we can, and even those persons are required to put their masks back back on as as uh, when when you're not speaking. Dr. Loftus, thank you. So um, let me see. Are we ready? Not yet. I'll give you a minute. We want uh, want that to work. Morning. Yes. Good morning, Mr. Chesnoff. Good, good morning. Good morning. Good. All right, this um, moment of tranquility was, uh, I hope you enjoyed that, that moment. <clears throat> now, back to the adversarial process. And we will. All right, so uh, Dr. Loftus, as I mentioned, has, uh, has returned to the witness stand. I'll remind you that you remain under oath. Yes. And uh, Mr. Lewin, you may continue with your cross-examination of the witness. Dr. Loft, I promise we're almost three quarters done. Um, I'm just kidding. I promise we'll be done before the lunch hour. Objection. With... <laughs> <laughs> I, I can go on longer, sure. Um, so when we left off last Thursday, we left off very suddenly, kind of in the middle of something, and I just want to make sure that where we are. You had just given your answer. I'd asked you a hypothetical about the six to eight witnesses, most of whom did not know each other, all of whom had said they never discussed anything with each other, and all of whom had said that either they had no outside information or they had an extremely strong memory of the actual statements from the close friend about her participation in helping to cover up a murder and that they were not influenced in any way by any outside statements or outside information. Do you remember that hypothetical? Something like that, yes. yes. And I asked you then, the question was, would you agree that in such a scenario, if that were true, 
that the witness memories, would they absolutely corroborate each other? And you responded, quote, if that had happened and there was no suggestion and you had multiple people versus a single person, you could call it corroboration and it would produce a tendency of wanting to think the gist was accurate. Do you recall saying that? Something like that. <laughs> and then I asked you if in that scenario would such, uh, if each of those hypothetical facts were true, be consistent or inconsistent with the implantation of false memory to those six to eight people? And you responded, in that hypothetical, I would say there is no evidence of any implantation. Do you recall saying that? Something like that. And that still, that still reflects both of those, your opinions, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. And then I asked you, and this is where we were, I asked you, I would assume that the reason you did not give a qualifier in those two answers is because you agree that no qualifier was necessary. Would that be correct? I was comfortable with the answer I gave. Okay, so, so again, Dr. Fikian, I'm going to ask my question again. You would agree in what I just read to you, your answers were, there was no qualifier, correct? I didn't, I didn't hear one, no. Okay, so I want you to assume that those were the answers that you gave. You have previously testified that you are extremely careful in all of your answers, which is why you have given qualifiers, including when I asked you whether the earth was round and you responded probably. Do you recall that testimony? So, well, something like that. I, you'd have to read it back to me. Well, this was just from last week, so I'm not talking about the exact words. Would you agree, doctor? that when I pressed you on the idea that you seem to give qualifiers for nearly every opinion I asked, you responded that as a scientist that you needed to be very careful, in essence, in the answers you gave. Is that a fair statement? Yes. So my question is, I would assume then that the reason you gave no qualifier at all to those two hypotheticals that I just went through is because you decided based on the information in the hypo hypothetical that no qualifier was necessary. Would you agree? Uh, yes. All right, I want to, I had a follow-up question regarding your work on the case. I want to know how many of the approximately 73 to 77 hours that you build on this case were spent watching actual video of witnesses and not simply going through transcripts? I, I don't know. Well, can you give an estimate, doctor? Did you, was it half your work? Was it a small amount? Uh, it was a large amount. So, doctor, you would agree that in going through the witnesses, you listed, and again, we're not talking about, I want to be clear, I don't want your opinion about any of the witnesses. We're not going to talk about names. I'm just talking about as a group. You indicated that you went through, you were given 41 different witnesses of statements to go through. Would you agree? Either part or all of some number. I don't remember if it was 41. Well, I want you to assume for a moment that Mr. Chesnoff has indicated in the discovery that you were given statements to review of 41 witnesses. Does that sound about right? I got information on perhaps that many people, yes. So my question to you would be, you would agree, doctor, and again, I don't want you to name any particular witness. There were certain witnesses who had almost that many hours worth of video one witness to watch. Would you agree? I don't know. Well, so doctor, the question would be then that if you're saying that you primarily reviewed video and if some of these witnesses that we're talking about themselves occupied three, four days of video, how would you have had the time to have actually seen video of these witnesses? Did you just look at little snippets? I, I might. I want to object on the relevancy since. Oh, right. I, I might not have watched all the videos. I probably didn't. Well, when you say probably didn't, doctor, that's a qualifier. You would agree. And again, you are aware now that there are witnesses in this case where there would be just in court testimony just in court testimony, 15, 20, 25 hours of video to watch, correct? 
I don't know the number, but I did not watch all the trial, no. Doctor, you didn't even watch all of the conditional examinations or videotaped interviews leading up to the trial, did you? I, I doubt it. Well, when you say you doubt it, at 73 hours, doctor, wouldn't it be rather than doubt it, it would be a physical impossibility, correct? Perhaps, maybe. I know okay. you won't like that, but maybe. Okay, that was. That was. I'm uh, reconsidering the objection. Thank you, doctor. I'm going to take one more shot here. If it's your testimony that you spent 73 to 77 hours, is it a fair response on your part to only say probably or maybe that I didn't go through? the majority of videotaped testimony on this case, or would a more accurate and fair answer be simply, no, I didn't do that? I doubt that I reviewed all the material, but I spent many more than those 77 hours. All right. And doctor, you would agree that to properly assess and to give a complete opinion on what's going on, you need to look at all of the available statements of the witness, correct? Objection, irrelevant. Yes, sustained. You're on, on, on relevance grounds? Yes. 352. 352, okay. All right, I want to talk for a moment. Uh, one question about your work on Harvey Weinstein. In re listening to your testimony, I re listened to all of it, I noticed that when you were asked about your fees, you said that you, quote, settled on a fee of $14,000, but I didn't ask you, what had your fees been before you, quote, settled? Uh, at the time, I, I quoted $600 an hour, and they, um, the office people I was interacting with said that there were all kinds of financial problems and asked me if I would agree four days in New York, and we didn't know it would be four days, uh, for $14,000, and I agreed to that figure. But hadn't you already spent time going over materials before that? Uh, that was not part of that case. So no. that case was simply, without going reviewing anything, you're just coming to court and testifying for the $14,000, no prep work. Is that correct? I was a teaching expert in that case. No specifics about the people the specific people were permitted or offered. Okay. I want to go back, doctor, to my questions regarding Rule 306. Last week, I asked you a question about ethics, and you said, if you recall, you needed more time to think about it. The question involved whether or not you would agree that it would be an ethical violation, a conflict of interest, for you to take on a case as an expert witness for the defense where a family member of yours was the named victim. Last week when I asked you, you said you needed more time to think about the issue, whether there would be a conflict or an ethical violation. And as you recall, at the time, I said, you know what, I'm going to return to this near the end of my questioning when you've had time to think about it. So now that you've had that time, can you tell me what your answer would be? Um, I read the two sentences in that um, guideline from the uh, psychology organization and I agree that if you th if there is a question that you might not be as competent or objective or effective uh, you should refrain from participating that makes sense to me so doctor you've now explained the rule so now applying the rule to that situation would you agree then that certainly you could not be objective in testifying as an expert witness where a family member was the named victim. Would you agree? I disagree with that. Okay. Um, I want to move on to uh, a couple of my last areas here. Um, would you agree, doctor, that in evaluating the accuracy and or credibility of any witness, any witness, when they are repeating a statement by somebody else. So you have a group of witnesses who allege they heard a statement from somebody else, from the same person. Following my, my question so far? Yes. Okay. 
would you agree that there really are only kind of three choices? Either the testifying witness themselves is lying, knowingly. Number two, the testifying witness is not lying, but they're mistaken about the substance of the original memory. Or that three, the testifying witness is neither lying nor mistaken about the original memory of what the close friend told them, that in actuality, the issue would be that the close friend was lying when they said it. Would you agree that those three possibilities would cover the situation in terms of you looking at the memories of witnesses reporting prior conversations with a witness? Would you agree? I agree those are three alternative possibilities, right. yes. And, and would you agree, doctor, that in terms of those possibilities, that as an expert on memory, that the only one of those three that you're qualified to discuss, you're not qualified to say whether the witnesses are lying. You would agree that's up to the jury, right? That's, yes. Okay, you would agree you're not qualified to say whether or not the original source of the information was lying. That's, again, up to the jury, correct? Yes. The only of those three possibilities, the only area where you would be able to render an expert opinion would be if, in fact, the theory is these witnesses are not lying. They are simply mistaken in their memories. Would you agree? That, that's exactly uh, what I study. When people say things that are not authentic, but they are not deliberately lying. That's, that's the only expertise I have. Right. And you would agree, there is a fourth possibility, though, correct? And that would be that the witnesses are not lying, and they're not inaccurate repeating what was told to them, and that the source of the information was not lying when they said it. You would agree that's a fourth possibility, correct? Y yes. And you would agree that in deciding those possibilities, that's the jury's job, is that right? Absolutely. And finally, you would agree that as an expert, your appropriate role is simply to explain to the jury your belief and your experience of how memory works, right? Yes. And you would agree that in testifying as an expert witness, you're not in any way suggesting that any memory in this case was implanted. You're just saying, here's how memories can be implanted. And jury, you need to figure out if it happened in this case. Is that right? Yes. Um, you would also agree that the jury who has heard all the evidence of the case, they're in the best decision position to decide which of these scenarios is correct. Would you agree? Yes. Okay. I'm going to go to my last area right now. You have previously related in your prior testimony in profile pieces, and in fact, you testified about it during this case, that you have kind of difficulty acknowledging or discussing your accomplishments, kind of acknowledging your ego. Is that correct? Uh, well, I, I would prefer that other people mention the accomplishments rather than I do it, yes. In, in fact, you were asked this exact question. I asked this to you during the Jackson case in 2012 at page 148, lines 4 through 6, where I asked you, ma'am, you don't have a prob problem acknowledging your ego, correct? And you responded, I disagree with that. I do have a problem. Does that encompass your belief in this area? I, I'm not sure. I, I, I believe that I may have said that 13 years ago, but I, and it, I'm not going to disagree with it now. Okay. And in your 1996 book, The Diva of Disclosure, you stated on page two of that book, quote, I keep thinking of Oscar Schindler circling the lake with thousands of people. If I could save one more person, can you indicate, since you've compared yourself to Oscar Schindler, who's Oscar Schindler? Uh, I did, there are falsehoods in your assumption in your question, so I can't answer the question. Well, Doctor, have you not, in the Diva of Disclosure, on page two of your book, did you not say, I keep thinking of Oscar Schindler circling the lake with thousands of people if I could save one more person? I never wrote a book by that title. You'll have to show me what you're talking about. Are you familiar with, a, with a, an article or a book called The Diva of Disclosure? 
uh, there was uh, an article in the 90s um, that but written by somebody else that not written by me. Doctor, there was you, a title something like that. Did you give that quote? Your Honor, we've never seen this. No. Wait, what? Uh, he says he, he says he hasn't uh, hasn't seen it. That's well, I, okay. I that's not. Uh, wait, wait. If he if you're going to present it to the witness, show it. Otherwise, you. Let's put it up. I'll put it up, Your Honor. Show it to the, 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 the council. Show it to the council. article in Psychology of Today on you by Jim Nymark. Does that Jill. refresh your recollection at all? Jill. Jill Nymark, thank you, sorry. Yes. Okay, so I want to go and I want you to read starting with but act five out loud please. Uh, but act five is yet to come and may never end for how do these innocently accused individuals put their lives back together? It is the theme that haunts Elizabeth Loftus. Quote, I keep thinking of Oscar Schindler circling the lake with thousands of people, she says, without a trace of irony. Though she adds that she realizes people may misinterpret the statement as one of hubris. If I could save one more person. Doctor. He he accused have been shot at, ostracized, imprisoned, interrogated, lost jobs, homes, and forced to fight lawsuits that have sometimes bankrupt them. In some cases, the charges seem entirely false. As Wall Street Journal writer Dorothy Rabinowitz writes of the notorious Amaral case, where three members of a family were accused of molesting the children in their model daycare center, quote, no reasonable person who looked at the trial transcript could doubt that three innocent citizens were sent to prison on the basis of some of the most fantastic claims ever presented to an American jury, so, end quote. So doctor, are you telling me that you literally forgot until you read this that you compared yourself to Oscar Schindler? It doesn't say that, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Objection, mischaracterizes. What was, what's in the article? It's, it, in fact, okay, let's have our first sidebar of the day. All right, let's. Uh, May I continue, Your Honor? Yes, yes. Okay. Doctor, so the question I have for you is you would agree that the quote. Bring up Oscar Schindler, that was you bringing up Oscar Schindler, correct? It said I was thinking about him. Right, right. but I'm just saying, it's not the reporter asked you about Oscar Schindler. You interjected Oscar Schindler into this, correct? Yes. And my question to you is, doctor, do you really think it is a fair comparison to equate yourself as an expert witness charging $700 per hour to a man who helped the Jews avoid execution in the Holocaust. Is that a fair comparison? I wasn't comparing myself to him. He is somebody who said, I wish I had more time to save one more person. And that's exactly how I feel. I wish I had more time 
to save one innocent person. Like Tim Hennis. Objection, Your Honor, beyond no. the agreement. No. <laughs> yeah, she responded to the question. Uh, That's why, like Tim Hennis, correct? I'll, 352. I'll, I'll sustain the objection. Thank you, Your Honor. Redirect? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. I'll try to, try to get us out of here before lunch. Okay. You, if not, that, you take the time you need. Thank you. Uh, first question, Doctor. Are you related to, to Bob? No. Okay. Related to any of us? No. Okay, so this case has nothing to do with who you're related to or the ethics of that, correct? Correct. Okay. I'm going to show you uh, the chart which we previously worked with. Your Honor, I've marked it as next in order, which is defense G. G. Ready? G. Exactly. I like that. Um, Your Honor, I would move for its admission along with the CV, which was F, which we previously introduced. All right. We will discuss that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Please tell us again how acquisition is defined. Acquisition is, is a period of time, a phase where some event occurs. It, it could be a visual event, it could be a conversation, it could be any kind of event, and some information then might enter a person's memory at that time. And then again, explaining retention. Once that event is over and time is passing, that's the retention phase, uh, and then new factors come into play that can affect memory at the retention phase. And then the retrieval phase. Re retrieval is when somebody tries to remember what happened, tries to answer questions, testify in court. Uh, that, these are all acts of retrieval. And there, of course, can be many occasions where somebody is trying to retrieve information. You spent 77 hours reviewing materials that were provided to you by Mr. Durst's lawyers, correct? Yes. And you did that yourself, correct? Well, some of those hours were, were spent in, in, in um, I mean, having conversations about the material. Correct, but not, you didn't have like a graduate assistant reading it or an associate read it. You did it all yourself. Uh, no, right? I did everything myself, yes. Okay. And. We didn't ask you to look at everything because your testimony was going to be limited to teaching the jury about how memory works, not about the particular witnesses in this case, correct? That's correct. Did I ever ask you or did Mr. DeGaran ever ask you to give an opinion on Mr. Durst's guilt or innocence? No. In fact, have you ever even met Mr. Durst? No, I, I've not met him, actually, personally, no. Have you ever talked to him? I, I believe I waved to him once. In court? In court, yeah. I've never talked to him, though. No. And he no. waved back? I think he waved back, or he, he maybe waved first. I'm not sure. So please tell the jury what you understood you were hired for. To... Um, communicate information about the nature of memory, uh, the kinds of things that can affect memory, the malleability of memory, when people uh, do develop uh, false memories or exaggerated memories or changed memories, what their characteristics are, that they can be detailed and confident and even emotional about false memories, the nature of memory. How do leading questions affect witnesses' memories? Well, leading questions can come into play at the retrieval phase and can contaminate what a person remembers and, and then can also act like post-event information and affect what people remember subsequently when they try to retrieve at a later time. Can being interviewed where there are multiple people present, multiple law enforcement people present, impact memories based on the studies? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I can point to a study where if there's a single law enforcement versus multiple, whether 
whether that would affect the accuracy. I, 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 as I sit here, I, I can't think of a study that would really allow me to answer that one way or another. Are there studies that can explain to the jury how being interviewed with hypotheticals can impact memory? Yes, there are studies that show if you give people kind of a hypothetical situation, um, sometimes people will remember that hypothetical as if it were something that happened or something they experienced. That can be a form of post-event suggestion. Can leading questions uh, cause the same issues? Yes. Repeated leading questions? If you repeat the post-event suggestion, it maximizes its um, suggestive effect. What it, impact, it increases it. That's our issue. I'm sorry. What, what impact would persistent interrupting questions have on a witness? Uh, from my own experience here in court, it's kind of stressful. And what does stress do in terms of people's memory? Oh, that's, well, stress is not, not particularly good for, for, for memory. Can you explain to the jury why? Uh, well, sometimes it leads to distracting thoughts and you can lose your focus. Um, can it also lead to um, having information imparted that you really didn't remember? Uh, yeah, there is evidence that if you, uh, if, if people are sometimes aroused, they can be more susceptible to contamination. How about if a person has a false memory? Can that person still be convinced that they remember that which is untrue? In other words, you have a false memory, you really don't know that it's false in some instances, correct? That's, that's, that's true. In, in, in all of these studies, when people succumb to the suggestion uh, that they're exposed to, they, they don't uh, realize that their, their recollections have been distorted or contaminated. It, it feels like a recollection to them. Now, in the course of um, your years of work, have you lectured to lawyers in continuing le le legal education settings? Many times, yes. And can you explain to the jury the purpose of your lectures? Objection, relevance, three to outside the, uh, the scope of cross. Oh, Rob. <coughs> uh, well, I. I have done lots of lecturing to different members of the legal profession, to lawyers, uh, many defense attorneys, also groups of prosecutors, um, particularly uh, back in 1983 to the Arizona prosecutors after a, um, well, maybe this is saying too much, but. Um, after a, a conviction was overturned when my testimony was excluded, uh, and so the prosecutors invited me to lecture to their group. Um, then all kinds of law enforcement agencies, uh, some of which I mentioned earlier in this testimony, the Secret Service, the FBI, the CIA, and other groups. Do you vary your lecture on the science of memory when you're talking to different groups? or do you tell people your science? How does that work? I, I tell them about the science and, and, and about what I and, and, and many other scientists have learned about the nature of memory and, and the whole uh, effects of interviewing and, and other things that are relevant to the legal profession. Have you provided scientific information that has caused law enforcement in the photo lineup situation to change their practices? Well, well it's not just my work, but the, the work of, of me and many others have, it, it have changed the way law enforcement agencies actually conduct their interviews and their testing, yes. And that's based on the studies and the work that you've done and that you've studied, correct? Well, I don't want to take full credit for it, but, but some of the work that I've done, but also many other scientists who've worked in the same field and who have communicated these scientific findings to law enforcement 
to affect those changes in the way things are being done. So the law enforcement people have taken what you and other people like you in your field have said about memory and modified the way they do things so that it's more consistent with getting a true memory. Is that no, fair? Since that's not an evidence. It also is going to call for hearsay. There's also a lack of foundation. And it's also 352 and irrelevant both. Oh, that's everything. Let's see. If I hit four out of five, I'd be in the Hall of Fame. Okay, hold on. Overruled. <laughs> that objection was so long that I forgot the question. Would you like it read back? Uh, yes, please. Madam Court Reporter, would you be kind enough to read it back? Uh, yes, it is. I could give an example if you, it would help. Please. So, um, one kind of thing that law enforcement uh, typically or frequently might do is uh, take a witness to a crime and show them a lineup. Um, the the long-standing question is, who should conduct that lineup? Should it be the investigating officer? Or should it be somebody who does not know who the suspect is? Got an objection relative to 32 within the context of this case. Well, no, it's it's overruled. It's it's <clears throat> all right. It, it's overruled. That's fine. <clears throat> and in the past, many law enforcement agencies would have the investigating detective conduct the lineup. But now, after considerable research that shows that it is far better to have a person conduct the lineup who does not know who the suspect is, many agencies are changing the way they do things so that they do what is called blind testing. A person conducts the lineup who doesn't know who the suspect is, so they cannot inadvertently cue the witness to try to pick number five, and they cannot give feedback to the witness uh, after an identification is made, and, and thereby artificially inflate or deflate uh, their confidence. So your science has assisted law enforcement in those instances? We think so, yes. Um, Mr. Lewin asked you about the 350 people that have been exonerated. You didn't exonerate them, did you? Don't, didn't a judge or a court do that? Uh, th that's correct. The, the, this is the Innocence Project in New York, in New York um, and uh, they have um, provided information about 350 cases. Uh, I, you know, I may have worked on a couple of those cases, but I'm not the person who does the exoneration. They have found uh, uh, evidence that, that proved um, to a court that these individuals were actually innocent. I, I did one of these cases, and so my question is this. There are people who are exonerated by a court. Do I need an objection, Your Honor, or it's an inappropriate question the way it starts? I, I suppose. Well, rephrase it. Okay. Experienced lawyers volunteer just like you sometimes volunteer to help in these exoneration cases, correct? Yes. Okay. And when the person is exonerated, it is done by a court, correct? Yes. Sometimes the district attorneys join in the request, correct? In, so in some cases, yes. And those people who sat in jail that were not guilty of what they were put in jail for are victims in your mind, are they not? 
They're suffering victims, but so are their extended family members. And so when you were answering Mr. Lewin just now about your desire to be able to do this for as many people as possible, it's because you have experienced people who are victims of having been falsely convicted, correct? Yes. Mr. Lewin asked you about people who don't know each other having a similar memory. If the different people are questioned by the same person who asks leading questions, presents hypotheticals with other people on his team present, is it possible General, that... This is an inappropriate hypothetical okay. that does not reflect okay. the evidence. We can go sidebar. Okay, okay. Let him, let him finish it. Thank you. If the... If different people are questioned by the same person who asks leading questions, who presents hypotheticals with other people on his team present, can that impact them having a similar memory? All right. I do think it does call for a... I'll sustain the objection. Okay. We can talk sidebar if you like or not. Okay. I, I will try it, Your Honor. How about if the different people with similar memories all were exposed to news accounts, movies, books, gossip, things like that? Can that impact their memory? Improper hypothetical Overall. based on the evidence, Your Honor. Overall. Those would be other examples of post-event suggestion that can, could contaminate the memory of people even if they didn't talk with each other. So people who don't know each other who tell the same story can have a false memory impacted by post-event suggestion, correct? That can happen, yes. Can one's opinion of the truthfulness of the person telling the story affect the acquisition process? It, it, it could. Uh, if you are hearing a story from somebody you don't think is particularly truthful, you might not pay as much attention to it, and that would be one way in which the uh, credibility of the speaker could affect acquisition. So if the person is known as a liar, a storyteller, an exaggerator, a drama queen, that could have impact on the memory, correct? It could. What scientific effect does post-event information have on memory? Well, oh, I, I thought I have already testified about that, so I'll just be brief that okay. post-event information uh, can supplement memory, can contaminate memory, can distort memory, uh, distort your memory for the details of an event that actually did happen, and it can even plant entirely false memories in the mind of someone for something that didn't happen. Um, I probably did ask this. If I did, I apologize to everybody, but could you remind us what confidence inflation is? Uh, yes. Um, when somebody gives you a memory report and, and they say, I'm, and they express a level of confidence, they might say, you know, I think that's true, or uh, they give up maybe a low confidence number, 30% sure, or 50% sure, or they, in words, indicate kind of a lack of confidence, my memory is foggy. If you give them feedback, if you give them post-event information that, uh, uh, for example, other people are saying the same thing, or some kind of information that reinforces this memory, you can inflate their confidence. They're not more accurate, but they become more confident because of that post-event feedback. A couple more questions. Does the notoriety of the defendant affect the science of memory as far as you're concerned? No. You know, lawyers will take unpopular cases because of the Constitution and doctors have the Hippocratic Oath. You tell the jury why it is that you testify on behalf of citizens that are accused of crime that have not been convicted. Because we are living in a, a democratic society where uh, even everyone has a right to 
be presumed innocent, and, and even unpopular people have a right to, to a trial, and thank goodness there are people who are willing to step in and make sure these rights are protected. Is it easier for you to help the indigent when you do because you get paid by people in other cases that can afford your, your hourly rate? <laughs> well, I, I don't know if it's easier. I, I mean, I, you know, I can work on cases where I can be paid well, but, but I also, throughout my career, I've worked for many poor people who couldn't really afford much of anything and even, you know, would stay at the home of a, a lawyer or someone to save the indigent defendant from having to spend money on a hotel room. As a scientist, doctor, do you judge the defendant or do you leave that to the jury? That's absolutely the jury's job. Court's indulgence. further questions you want all right bit. okay let's come back at 1:30. all right <clears throat> so ladies and gentlemen we'll return right at 1 30. do not converse among yourselves or with anyone else on any subject connected with this case do not form or express any opinion on the case all, right, all of our jurors are present and now with that, we can, uh, Mr. Chestnut? Yeah, may I ask one last question before Mr. Lowe begins? Ah, a very well. Question. Out of an abundance of caution, did I buy you a six-inch Subway sandwich and a bag of potato chips for lunch? You did, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Additional compensation. You can cross-examine on that point and anything else. You just uh, might. Uh, Mr. Lewis. I would think he'd be better than Subway, but... <laughs> and I'll remind you that you are under oath. We'll try to get you out of it before that, whatever Subway makes their sandwiches out of, goes through your system. So we'll, okay. we'll try to hurry here. Uh, doctor, you were asked some questions on redirect by uh, Mr. Chesnoff regarding the confidence of witnesses in their memory. Do you recall a couple yes. of questions that he asked you? Would you agree that there is a correlation in the studies between the confidence of a witness's memory and the accuracy? Under many conditions, there is, yes. I also want to ask you, you were asked a series of questions by Mr. Chesnoff regarding how your work has been applied to lineups. Do you recall those questions? Oh, well, I answered about lineups. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You would agree, doctor, there's no lineup issue whatsoever in this case, right? Correct. And would you agree that any testimony you're giving about either eyewitness identification, any statements you've made about, any statements about lineups, they are completely irrelevant to any of the issues presented here, right? There is no lineup in this issue, but they're, they're memory issues, and they sometimes apply to all kinds of memory for different kinds of material. Right, so let me again, please listen to my question. Is there in any way an eyewitness identification issue in this case that you're aware of? Well, there, there may be a voice identification issue. You were asked questions and you've talked about in your research, in your testimony regarding some of the problems with eyewitness identification, correct? Yes. Is, let me ask again, are you aware, doctor, of an eyewitness identification issue in this case? Uh, no, I'm not. Are you aware of an issue involving a lineup in this case? No. By the way, did the defense in going over when they retain you, did they ever say to you, hey doctor, our position in this case is either 
A, the witnesses are lying, or B, the witnesses are honest but mistaken, or C, the witnesses are neither lying nor mistaken, but that the original declarant was lying. Did they ever discuss with you or clarify with you, hey, what is their position? Uh, no, I don't recall that kind of discussion. As you sit here today, then you really don't have any idea with respect to this case, which of the positions they're even going with. In other words, whether it's witnesses are lying, whether it's the witnesses are being honest but they're mistaken, or whether it's, no, you know what, they're not lying or mistaken, it was the original source that was lying. You don't know which of those three is even their position, is that right? Well, I could make an educated speculation about that, that, that there's at least some concern that so, there may be a, a false memory or false belief in this case, other, because that's what my work is really all about. But that's kind of another way of saying that unless their position is number two, that the witnesses are mistaken but not lying, that's the only one of those possibilities that you're really equipped to testify about. Objection, Your Honor. The first one, relevance. Well, that's relevant. It's also it's beyond the scope. I think that's out of scope. I'll sustain it. Doctor, you were asked some hypotheticals by Mr. Chesnoff. Is that correct? Last week? Last week and today during your redirect, you were asked some hypotheticals by Mr. Chesnoff. Do you recall that? Yes. As you sit here, is it fair to say that rather than assessing whether or not those hypotheticals actually relate to what happened in this case, you are assuming that the hypotheticals that he is giving you, that they are supported by facts, and then you are simply answering, assuming those facts are true. Is that right? Yes, I'm answering, assuming they're, assuming that the hypothetical is what I'm responding to, yes. And you would agree that if it turns out that the hypothetical facts that Mr. Chesnoff is giving you, if those hypothetical facts are inaccurate, then that certainly affects any conclusion that you draw. Mr. Chesnoff is nodding no as I'm asking my question, and th that is... Uh, I, I apologize, Your Honor, I just... Well... I, I, I'm sorry. I'm not sure if he's coaching the witness or reacting to your question. Well, but I'm way, more worried about number one. Well, <laughs> okay. I, I think at this point in time, Your Honor, to suggest that I would coach Dr. Loftus. No, please be seated. Well, it's no argument here. It's it's uh, it doesn't matter. Don't, so, don't shake don't keep, shake your head. It seems inadvertent. Ma'am, so you go back to your question, please. Doctor, if you can. So let me again. So what I'm asking you is, would you agree that if in fact the facts that Mr. Chesnoff gave you to assume to be true. If those facts are not true, you would agree that your conclusions based on those facts would have far less relevance than if the facts were true. My response was to the hypothetical and it assumes they're true, period. Okay, so, so now if you, can, if you can answer the question I just asked, let me say it again. Given that what you've just said, you would agree then that if the facts aren't true, then your answers that assume the facts to be true would have less value than if the facts he were giving you were true, correct? I responded based on what the science would say about the hypothetical. If you want to change the hypothetical, maybe the science would not apply to it. D Doctor, so listen to my question again, please. What I'm asking you is, trying to make it as simple as I can. Mr. Chesnoff asks you to assume certain facts to be true. You've said you understand that, correct? Yes. You then gave opinions based on those facts being true, correct? Yes. If those facts were not true, were not supported by the evidence, you would have to agree that your conclusions, your response to those facts which are not true would have less value if any, than if those facts were true. Agreed? Well, I wouldn't put it that way, but I possibly I would agree with it. Well, okay, how would you put it? You won't let me put it the way I want to put it. I'm asking, please, put, I, I want you to explain how possibly that might be true. 
I responded with what the science would say about a hypothetical that was presented to me. Uh, if, if the jury wants to decide that the hypothetical doesn't fit, then they can, they can ignore the application of the science to it. But my science still applies to that hypothetical. So, Doctor, again, though, and, and uh, please listen to my question. Sure. If asked yes. and answered, no. It's not asked and answered. No. <clears throat> Try again. Doctor, so please listen to my question. I really need an answer. Your Honor, could you strike the please listen to my well, question part? I mean, <clears throat> yeah, yes, it's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not necessary. Your Honor, then I'm, then I would ask the court to instruct the witness. What else can I do? Ask the question. If you don't get the answer, move to strike it, and that it's non-responsive. Okay. Ask another question. You may ask. You may communicate the idea. You don't think the witness is answering the question by asking it again and again. But All right. I will. Uh, you don't need to tell the witness anything. Doctor, if you are giving a response and you are assuming, assuming that the facts that you are using to give that response are true and those facts turn out not to be true, will you concede that your response would have less value because you are considering in your response that the facts are true? Yes. Thank you. Doctor, you were asked, you discussed, excuse me, you mentioned that you've given lectures and you mentioned a 1983 lecture in Arizona to prosecutors, is that correct? It might have been 84. Right. It was after 83. Right. It's almost 40 years ago, correct? Well, you do the math. Uh, okay. Uh, I guess that'd be 37 years ago. Would you agree? Yes. My question to you would be, doctor, you would agree that your lecturing career, much like your testifying career, is in no way even close to equal. You primarily testify almost exclusively for the defense, and you primarily lecture not to the prosecution, but to the defense. Agreed? Uh, certainly, I would say more lectures to defense groups, yes. And more lectures to defense groups by an overwhelming margin, correct? I, I, I would have to go check. Well, you have your resume. If you would like a moment to review it, to refresh your recollection, go ahead. I would say more, certainly more often to defense. There, there, there are a number of situations where I've talked to prosecutors and defense attorneys together at Northwestern University year after year after year, but it may still not add up to the number of times that I've talked to uh, or been invited to lecture to defense groups or public, public defenders, for example. And that Northwestern lecture series, that's related to their Innocence Project, correct? No. Uh, I was, uh, every year for many years, a, a program for prosecutors and defense attorneys. Doctor, you testified that Mr. Chesnoff asked you, and you mentioned the Innocence Project, and you talked about 350 cases. You talked about this in your original direct. You talked about it in your redirect. Do you recall that testimony? Yes. And you would agree, doctor, that the extreme high majority of those cases, the way that the innocence was demonstrated was through DNA, correct? I believe in that project they're all, uh, maybe virtually all DNA exonerations, right. yes. Right. And I want to make sure, you didn't do any of the testing yourself, the DNA in those cases, right? Correct. So my question to you is, do you recall when I was asking you questions about Tim Hennis and the DNA in his case, and you were very skeptical. You mentioned it could have been contaminated. You mentioned I didn't see the results. My question is, doctor, how come you are so skeptical about the DNA in Tim Hennis, but yet when you had no involvement in any of these 350 DNA exonerations, you treat it as if it is fact? 
Why is that? I have read a, a, a fair amount of scholarship on the DNA exonerations in the Innocence Project cases. <clears throat> uh, in the case of Tim Hennis, I had people writing to me concerned about the prospect of contamination. That's all I know. There are concerns amongst people who were involved. And doctor, considering your knowledge of DNA, which you just indicated that you've read up and you're aware of those exonerations, doctor, are you aware of how it is that a person's semen, which would have to come from the person, can turn up. How does semen get created out of nothing? <clears throat> Objection, Your Honor. Oh, I'm going to sustain it. That's, that's misleading the, the deep. All right. Doctor, this is my last area. You mentioned that everyone has a right to be presumed innocent. You talked about being willing to step in. Do you recall that testimony today a few minutes ago yes. about your work? <clears throat> Doctor, Mr. Chesnoff also asked you, well, is the work that you do getting paid your $700 an hour? 600 No, it's now 7 Mr. Chesnoff. Yeah, we paid 6 uh, Doesn't sound like an objection, Your Honor. No, I, no, please. No, heck with <clears throat> Your current rate today is 700 an hour, correct, Doctor? Yes. Okay. So not, not in this case. It was 600 now it's 700 correct? Not, not in this case. I understand. Going forward, when you do work, it is $700 an hour. Is that right? Yes. So you're also making, you said, somewhere in the area of $260,000, $270,000 a year from your professorship at Irvine. Is that correct? I gave a number that was approximately that, but not that. Go ahead. You, so you're okay, but is it approximately that? Yes. And would you agree, doctor, that the idea that you need to charge $700 an hour in order to be able to work with indigent defendants. Is that, is that your testimony? I, no, that's not my testimony. It, in fact, doctor, when I you're charging $700 an hour to Harvey Weinstein or Bill Cosby or Robert Durst, you're still getting your salary from UC Irvine. As soon as facts not in evidence. Sustained. Your Honor, the Sue's tax, she's, yes. do you want me to cover it? She's already testified. I, I sustain the right, objection, Mr. It. Lewin. I'll cover it. Doctor, isn't it true that you were paid, your, your fee was approximately six to $700 an hour with Bill Cosby? I, I believe it. I was charging $600 an hour when I consulted on that case. And you testified previously in the Weinstein case that you were receiving $600 per hour, is that correct? Well, that was the fee that I quoted, but I made the arrangement that I discussed for the New York case. And you said that you're receiving $600 per hour in this case, correct? Well, I think uh, given your uh, antics, it's probably down to $450 an hour now. Gosh, I hope you'll be able to get by. I'll try. Move to strike. Uh... Never mind, it's okay. So, doctor. Let it, let it stay. No, I'm striking. The, the antics, I'm like stricken as well, Your Honor. I'm striking the whole dialogue. Okay, so, doctor. Let's <laughs> just start over. My, my question is this If you are making six to seven hundred dollars an hour testifying or working on cases for people like Mr. Durst and Mr. Weinstein and Mr. Cosby, is it really your testimony? that you need to charge that to be able to work on cases involving the indigent. I never, I never said that. That's not my testimony. In fact, doctor, you're charging that money because as you've said, that's what witnesses get in your area, at least on the high end, and that you believe that in the end, that's what you're worth, right? What I testified about is that I have discovered that many experts who are younger than me and much less experienced are charging quite a bit more, even one recently charging $1,500 an hour. So, Doctor, the question though is I just want to make sure that we're getting the facts out here. It's not your position, as Mr. Chesnoff suggested in redirect, that you have to take these high-paying cases to supplement the other work you do. Is that correct? 
that, that is not my testimony. Right. No. In the end, doctor, you're collecting your salary from UCI and you're collecting your expert witness fees because this is America and we're a capitalist country and you can charge what you want and people will pay it. That's what you get, correct? Yes. No further questions. Anything else? I do, but I'm not letting them get up again, so no. Well, so, Your Honor, there's got to be a consistency of rules here. I mean, if, well, I, if I don't mind. You conceded. Okay. It's uh, Mr. Chesnoff. Uh, I have no further questions. Yeah. Thank you. May this witness be excused. May she stay? Yes, but, Your Honor, um, Dr. Loftus has asked if she could remain. Okay. I hope it's off the clock, but I don't have a I don't have an issue. I hope it's off the clock too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. not, probably not as much as your client. Yes, but she, she may be uh, an excused from test further testimony. We, we don't have any issue with her remaining in the courtroom. You, okay, so you are excused. You may remain in the courtroom if you like. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Loftus. <laughs> Next witness. Your Honor, I think uh, we need to take a brief break uh, before we... Depends who the next witness is. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, the next witness will be Mr. Durst, Your Honor. All right. Um, you believe we need a break. We only need to change the seating. Is there something else I need to do? Yes, uh, the seating um, and some additional issues with uh, just to make sure that Yes, that's the right. Just, right, we've got to get the um, set up a desk with the uh, there are a couple of logistical uh, things in the room. So we're going to take our take a break. I think we can do ten minutes right now. I think that's enough. No, fifteen. All right, Deputy Washington advises fifteen, and I call Deputy Washington suggestions. <laughs> so, fifteen minute break, ladies and gentlemen. Do not converse among yourselves or with anyone else on any subject connected with this case. Do not form or express any opinion on the case.